we are going to take some time today to look back on the election that, well, should have been was, but still <laughs> actively is. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll preface this by saying there are a lot of things we don't know right now. Not only do we not know who uh, has won the presidential vote, um, but in the places where ranked choice voting is being used, we also don't know how much or often the second and third ballots have had to kick in yet. Um, Maine is still counting votes, um, as well as many places uh, across the country. Um, but so our reflection is going to be a little bit just looking at pure raw numbers and seeing how uh, things could have been different if ranked choice voting had been available to us, um, both here in Nebraska, as well as nationwide. Uh, so I'm going to share a little slideshow with you. Um, can everybody see it? Everybody sees the big logo? Yep. All right. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm on dual screens. That way I can see all your faces where we're going. If at any point you have a question or a comment, any personal analysis you want to throw in, go ahead and interrupt. Uh, like this is, this is really meant to be a conversation more than it is a presentation. Um, because, you know, it affects all of us. There's, you know, we probably, I, I would guess that no one in this room voted the exact same way as anybody else. We're all coming from different districts. Uh, so we didn't have the same options, as well as just knowing that, you know, we are a nonpartisan group. We are welcoming of all political opinions across the spectrum. Um, just really looking at how ranked choice voting can benefit everyone as just a step forward for democracy. Um, so I want to first start with a look back of, what, of 2016. Uh, it was a crazy year, and I, I know we all <laughs> remember that well. Um, my, the number one reason why I support ranked choice voting is because I don't feel it's right that a candidate who didn't receive a majority vote is able to win. Like it's possible if there are enough different candidates running, and we'll look at that in a second, that a candidate could receive less than a quarter of the votes and still win an election. Um, and I just don't think that's right. I feel that an elected official should represent uh, the majority opinion of the people who voted. Uh, now, these are the states in 2016 that were won without majority popular vote within the state. And as you can see, like some of them were super borderline. Um, my home state of North Carolina is always right on the line and um, is also a state that you typically has a Democratic governor while voting red for president almost every time. Uh, so, you know, a state that likes to teeter on the, defi on the defining line between red and blue. Um, but all these other states, I mean, Utah was especially weird because McMullen had such high support in Utah. Uh, and maybe one of the reasons why Utah as a state um, is working quite speedily on bringing ranked choice voting to their local and statewide elections. And we can look at that. Um, but this, this is the, the big number here. 29% of the entire electoral college was decided without a majority vote. I mean, that's 157. <laughs> that is beyond crazy in my mind. Um, regardless of how you feel about the person who won, like just the mere fact that like, you know, these tiny little votes, less than 1% of a vote change could have flipped on nearly half of these. Um, and same thing on the other side, uh, Hillary Clinton won the 10 electoral votes in Minnesota, but had lower support in Minnesota than she did in North Carolina. So that's also just a strange thing that we allowed to happen to be able to lose with more support than a, in a place where you won. Um, and the big thing to look at it on that national popular vote is this pretty high number of, of third party support, at least comparatively. Um, I mean, other than Ross Perot, we haven't seen a third party candidate really excel. Uh, but this combined, like, you know, there are a lot of people frustrated with both of the main candidates. Uh, and so there was this really high, comparatively high turnout for third party. And that's what led to this massive collection of electoral votes. Um, and there's our nice little Nebraska District 2 sitting there right on the list. Uh, and we are going to, we're going to come back to it uh, a few times. Um, I haven't checked since 730. This is as up to date as I can get for you. Um, but this is, this is the current projections for the election that we're looking at right now. Um, far fewer states are dealing with this lack of a majority. 
Um, and the big reason is pretty obvious to me, that third party vote, this is less than a third of what it was in 2016. Um, I, I personally wouldn't venture to say whether or not that's based on less popularity for the nominees for the third parties or for who those choices are. It very well could be that this was a campaign season that was entirely based on, um, and again, this is, this is me speaking my own opinion and not anyone else's in the organization. Um, there was a lot of fear mongering in this election from both sides, right? You can't vote third party because then the other person's gonna win and it's going to ruin America for the next four years. Now, whether or not that was true, that definitely hit home with a lot of people. And now we're in the situation where at least right now, one candidate does have a national majority in the popular vote. And we're only looking at four states, um, you know, that 20 something percent uh, of the electoral college is now down to 9.7. And it's quite possible that um, any of these can, uh, actually probably not Wisconsin and Nevada at this point, um, but Pennsylvania very well could end up hitting the, the majority threshold for either candidate as the votes, as the votes continue to be counted. Um, I wanna specifically look at Georgia because it is blowing my mind right now. And it is one place where the third party vote absolutely affected what's going on in the state. Um, we are, you know, what was a much more significant lead at one point is now down to a 0.1 difference between the candidates. Yep, it's literally like 3000 votes. Yeah, I, as, as someone who grew up in the Southeast, it's blowing my mind that that's happening in Georgia. Um, but this number right here, I mean, we can't, we can't assume that if Jorgensen wasn't an option, that all of the votes would have gone to one side or the other, right? People who vote Libertarian. I think it's fair to, ass I think it's fair to assume that it's, that, like, that's got like a 99.999% chance of not happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I know, I know Libertarians who definitely would have put Trump second and I know libertarians who definitely would have put Biden as their second choice had they been given that option. But I don't think we'd be sitting with this level of anticipation if we knew where those second place, if, if there had been second place votes here, where they would have gone. Um, and this only gets more complicated when we look at the other election going on in Georgia. <laughs> because we have Right here, you see two Democrats and two Republicans. This doesn't include like six or seven other candidates that received votes in this race. Yeah, that's a lot it of is beyond insane what is happening. Um, so th there's going to be a runoff. Like they said. Also, it's, sorry, it's down to 2,500 votes in Georgia now. So it's it's 49.4 percent to 49.4 percent now. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Just leaving me on edge even more. Um, so we have, we have this situation where there's going to be a runoff, which is not the first time it's happened in Georgia for a Senate election. And we're looking at this as we have multiple people from the same party that split each other's votes. We right. also can't assume that, um, you know, if Jackson was eliminated, we don't know if all of her votes would, would go to Warnick. Um, there's just no way to guarantee that that was a situation. Um, I'm gonna apologize now. I'm gonna speak about candidates colloquially with last names. I don't mean any disrespect in it. It's just easier to talk about that way. Um, so, you know, this is a case where if ranked choice voting existed in Georgia, we might know tonight who's gonna have control of the Senate. We might know tonight at the very least who won this race. And there's a huge problem with runoffs. First of all, they're expensive, right? We know how much money goes into the campaign season um, with the ads and the signs um, and the get out the vote efforts. Um, all <laughs> we're so glad that our campaign ads and phone calls and emails are ending. They are not ending in Georgia. Um, and we also know uh, from exit polling data that runoffs tend to not be widely participated in. Um, like we know that the number of people who participate cut down significantly. Uh, and we also know that that adversely affects voters um, who live in lower income and more heavily populated minority communities tend to have much, much, much less participation in a runoff. Uh, so if there was a chance to just say, let's not have a runoff, let's go ahead and say, if my candidate wasn't gonna be in the runoff, like we know that's gonna be Warnick and Waffler, um, that supporters of Collins, Jackson and all the others would be able to just go ahead and say, okay, if my person's not there, then I'd rather my vote go to that person next. 
It saves the time, it saves the money, and it makes sure that the people who bother to come and show up and cast their vote the first time are enforced to have to come back and do it again. Eliminates um, voter fatigue, I think, yeah. Yeah, some people are just done with campaign season and don't want to show up again. Um, and there would just be so much more civil engagement if they didn't have to do that a second time. Uh, yeah. The other, sorry? A bit, I was, I was just gonna say, uh, even on a local election type thing, uh, feedback we're getting uh, here in, uh, with this is that the candidates don't like to have to go out and raise the money for the runoff. You know, yeah. it's, it, it's a pain for them. And uh, and who knows what favors are asked for in, in you know, writing checks for people for, for runoff elections. So, uh, and, and you said it very well too, they, that, that a runoff election costs as much to run as the basic election did in the first place. So if you could avoid that election, that wow. amount of money is the amount of money you put back in your pocket. And uh, here in Kansas City, uh, a run and an election cost about a half million dollars. So imagine what it costs statewide to run a a runoff election. Mm -hmm. I would also uh, add that it's even more expensive with energy and time. It's lost opportunity to spend on other priorities to have to go back and redo this. So it's, it's in addition to money, it's very expensive otherwise I, too. I will add in, this would not happen in Nebraska. Um, just that 32% would be enough to just claim a winner, which we'll also get to in a second. Um, so like, I, I think it's important to be able to have that runoff so that someone can get to a majority vote. However, be able to do it all in the same voting time. Go ahead and, and skip forward just uh, for the sake of time. This is a map of the states where you can currently find ranked choice voting in use. Maine is the only one that is has used it for a statewide election. It happened this time. Um, I will say again, it ended up being a pretty boring statewide election in Maine. <laughs> And we can talk about it a little, a little bit more, but it um, turns out that ranked choice voting wasn't needed for any of their statewides this time. Every single statewide election was won by a majority. Uh, but a lot of states have these, have smaller communities where they've uh, been able to use it. So like Cambridge, Massachusetts is one of the longest standing RCV votes um, for their city council and mayor, um, as well as many communities in California, such as Berkeley, um, there's a lot going on. And something that I found out recently is that the Southern states in this uh, deeper purple here, um, they allow their overseas military voters to rank their votes for that same reason. Like if there's a runoff, this way they don't have to go and get their votes again. So they're already actively doing it for people mm -hmm. knowing that it's a convenience. Um, yeah, I have a question about that. Um, yeah. So I am actually military stationed here in Nebraska from Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, now, given I will preface this with I've always had issues getting my ballot from Alabama, so I've always had to do a backup ballot, but I've never seen an option for ranked choice voting on my ballot. So really, that, that piques my curiosity. And it might be because Alabama has failed to send me an appropriate ballot on time in the mm. five year trying. Um, but I'm actually the Secretary of State, I was actually on the phone with earlier today, and he's supposed to call me tomorrow. So I'm going to ask about that because I've, I've never seen that personally. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to find that out. Yeah, um, I'll say this map comes from to us from FairVote, uh, fairvote.org. They're an organization working on uh, the democratic process and voting across the country. Um, I can't vouch to say that the map is 100% accurate. I have pretty good faith in their research. And I, uh, I would have that also, to be honest. Yeah. I would, yeah, I would love to to keep us updated on that because I'm very fascinated to hear what's going on there. Yeah, I'll look into it and uh, I'll let you know what I hear back. Thanks. So online, it says that Alabama sends you a ranked choice ballot for elections where there's the possibility of a runoff. And so it might be like it requires a special election like Georgia is having right now, where they know that there's a strong possibility of a runoff and the majority of the elections that you've participated in haven't been that situation. Um, that makes because the only time we got a Democratic senator in Alabama was uh, a unique situation, to put it nicely. Yeah. So that, that makes sense. That's probably why I've never seen it then. 
That's um, good. You know, but again, it's an overseas. If you're voting absentee, but you're in uh, your station in the U.S., then you just get the regular absentee ballot. But if you if you're overseas, oh, you are right. I see. Then you get the then you get the uh, ranked choice ballot. That makes sense. I, I came back. I got a before. quick question. I'll let um, so if they if they do um, rank choice vote or if they do a runoff, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> do they? Oh gosh, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, wow, I had a thought and then I completely it slipped my. I apologize. Don't worry about it, Alex. All right, if it comes back, let us know. Okay. Okay. Um, so these are the places where um, a vote was held this week on whether or not these places would start utilizing uh, ranked choice voting as a tool. Um, Albany, California specifically uh, was had a motion to use single transferable vote. We're not gonna get into the nitty gritty of what that means, but it pretty much allows for multiple winners where they're using it for their city council where you can vote for multiple people to fill multiple seats. Um, but the rest of them, are different variations on rank choice voting. Um, some places only allow you to rank your top three. Some allow for rank everyone who's running, plus you can add in a write-in. Uh, lots of different things going on. And uh, there was there were statewide votes in Alaska and Massachusetts. Um, so first, let's take a look at these local ones. Um, overwhelmingly in local communities, this passed this year. Um, some of us were on a national call, like a national coalition call with ranked choice voting uh, advocates uh, this afternoon. Um, and you know, we're able to celebrate with the folks from California and Minnesota uh, who and Colorado who were able to make this happen for their communities. We're really excited for them. Um, Bloomington, Minnesota barely passed, but still it passed. Uh, and I just think, you know, being able to, to work, to operate in a smaller community at a time, I think definitely benefited them. Because if we look at the statewide results, um, Alaska is still counting votes, but right now only 35% voted in favor. Uh, and Massachusetts, which is, um, you know, one of the most progressive states as far as, you know, being open to considering new ideas, um, Surprisingly to me, uh, only 45% of people voted in favor of it. And what we learned from that uh, is that going statewide and trying to convince that many people at one time is a difficult thing to accomplish. Um, and you know, this actually has me rethinking our game plan, um, which is for the state of Nebraska and what this means for us and um, how we should be looking towards the future, right? Because we also know that Nebraska uh, with Maine is a unique enough place that we split our electoral vote. Um, but besides that, you know, seem, it's, a, it's a place where tradition is valued and um, changing people's mind to try something new might be a difficult task. Uh, but we know that if we can focus on smaller communities and start with mayors and city councils, boards of education, um, those kinds of things, people seem to be willing to try it. Uh, on those smaller levels, and that's going to pick up ground to the point where, you know, so many communities in California are already using it anyway, that'll be very easy for them to to pass a statewide measure. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Lower stakes. Um, so I, I can't see the chat right now. So um, just uh, any of our other uh, RTV and any people, if you see a question pop up in the chat, um, just let me know and we'll, uh, we'll address that. Um, so let's talk about Nebraska, because that's what we're here to talk about. Um, our statewide votes, just like Maine, were all won with majority votes this time. There was no controversy. There was no concern about, well, you know, spoiler effect. Um, third parties did not garner enough votes to make an impact on the election this time. Um, again, for the, the same, possibly for the same reasons that we talked about before. Uh, so nothing really to, to dive into. In this case, ranked choice voting would not have affected our statewide election. Uh, however, let's take a look at that second district. Um, it has had an interesting history here. Uh, and twice in the past uh, six elections, in 2008, it says 50%, but in order to have a majority, you have to have 
one step above. This is really like a 49.9% that's been rounded up. Um, so this is not in itself a majority that uh, this was for Barack Obama in 2008. And this number even lower, only 48% of Nebraska's second district voted for Trump in 2016, um, but that was enough because of the way that vote was split. And we saw that on the, the, the 2016 list earlier. Um, what I found intriguing not has, has nothing to do with ranked choice voting, uh, but the Nebraska's second district winner has every time except for 2012, and we don't know yet about 2020, but other than 2012, wherever Nebraska second goes, so goes the country. Uh, so that means that we're living, at least those of us who are in the second districts, I know we're coming from all over the state, but those of us in the greater Omaha area tend to be, uh, have our, you know, have a good feel for what the country's thinking and feeling. Um, so that's an interesting thing to know. Um, but there have been times, one time that a Democrat has won the vote and one time that the Republican has won the vote since 2000, uh, where ranked choice voting very well could have changed the result of, of that one vote, which one vote might not make a huge difference to everyone else in the country, but it definitely makes a big difference to us who vote in it. Um, and who knows this year, it might actually be you know, the game changer uh, that is yet to be seen. Um, the Nebraska Democratic Senate primary this year was a rough one. Um, and so I'm gonna apologize for bringing it up because I know we have some people in this room who worked on that campaign for different candidates. Uh, and it's been a little bit of a sore subject, um, but we need to talk about it because this in my mind is such a clear indicator of why we need ranked choice voting in this state that uh, the candidate who may, got the name on the ballot, Chris Janicek, only had 30% support of Nebraska Democrats and yet was the representative of the Democratic Party on the ballot. Um, regardless of what you think of, of Chris Janicek as a person, as a candidate, that is such a low amount of support that it should not be a surprise to anyone that you know, he didn't even break, I think, a third of the popular vote statewide. Like I think he, he was, he might've been in, in the twenties. Um, I haven't seen the updated numbers. Uh, and I can't see Angie's percent on your- Oh, is it blocked? Part? I'm sorry. So um, second place was Angie Phillips with 23.8. Um, Alicia Shelton had, had 22.8. So these two both, and um, for those who, uh, who weren't following um, up to that point. Um, after the election, Phillips uh, threw her support behind Shelton and they kind of like combined their supporters to try to push for Shelton to be on the ballot instead of Janicek, which in essence, I mean, Phillips had more votes than Shelton did on this ballot, but had it been a ranked choice situation, Janicek very well may still could have won. I'm not saying that he wouldn't have won if we had had ranked choice voting, um, but we do know that Shelton supporters and Phillips supporters were closely linked. Um, and it's very likely that one set of them would have overwhelmingly supported the other, which would have been enough to at least pass Genesec if not get to that 50% line. Um, this could have been a very different election, which would have also drastically changed the general election for the Senate also, because um, we know that uh, Senator Sass also um, was a little more free spoken in recent days on his opinions. And uh, I think this allowed, because there wasn't united support in one party, gave him the freedom to speak his mind a little bit more in a way that a candidate usually can't if they're trying to consolidate support within their party. Um, so an interesting thing to think about. Uh, last things we're going to look at is two districts in the, in the Nebraska legislature um, where ranked choice voting could have been very simple and could have been um, not complicated, but could have been a more interesting thing to look at. Uh, so this is District 9. Um, we have Kavanaugh, Snow, and Vondrasek. Uh, Kavanaugh and Snow were both endorsed by the same political party, um, but both and came pretty close to each other in the general that, you know, 6% of the vote uh, in a district that the total votes cast was only like 4,000, I think. Um, so very close and very easy. These two move on um, to face just each other in the general and Kavanaugh won um, with a pretty clear majority. That's very simple. 
and this election worked exactly the way that ranked choice would have. We could have completely eliminated the need for a primary if we had just had one vote, ranked choice, done. And the voters for Vondrasek could have split votes probably likely the, the same way as this. It is different because in the general election, there was you know, probably 10 times as many voters who showed up for it than did for the primary. Um, so you know, who knows if this was even a clear reflection of how the voters really felt between the three of them because there's such low voter turnout. If we only have one time that you have to show up, the fewer times you ask people to show up, the more of them are going to show up. Um, and so that's something interesting to look at. But this was only three candidates and only one had to get eliminated to get to those final two. Let's look at something more complicated. District 11. <laughs> I don't know uh, what, what districts each of you are from. I don't know if this was an election any of you had to vote in, um, got to vote in, I should say. Uh, but here we have something pretty fascinating. We had a very clear top choice amongst the several candidates uh, who were there. But then second, third, fourth, were not very far off from each other. And, sh and it had these candidates been eliminated one at a time and those votes redistributed, uh, who knows who would have ended up in second place. But being as it was, um, McKinney, who did not have a huge gap between second and third place, went on and ended up dominating in the general. So who's to know? Um, this is not my district, so I have not done any research into who these uh, who these legislators are or who the candidates are. Um, so I, I don't, I honestly don't know much about who was running in this election. Um, but just looking at it, like it is fascinating that someone who was that far behind from first place to second place ended up winning because all of these votes, all of this support got redistributed. However, what would have happened should say Womack have pulled ahead of McKinney through a ranked choice? Right, we could have, this could have turned out completely different in so many different ways based on how each of these people's supporters, each of these candidates supporters might have gone in a different way. Uh, so that is <laughs> my look back at <laughs> our election. It was, uh, I took up far more time than I was supposed to, to go through this, um, but I hope it was worth looking at because I think this just shows so clearly the need for a different voting system that reflects the will of the voters and gives us the chance to make sure our representatives run clean elections, have majority support, and don't waste time and money on extra elections that really just are not necessary for us to pick our leaders.